12 lessons from nearly 10 years in business coming up right now on the Rise to the Top. Hello, 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 and welcome, my friends. It is your great and good friend, David Seipagar. Welcome here to episode number 11 of the all new. I don't know. Is it, how long do I keep saying all new? You know, I, I don't know how long I can say that. We'll, get, we'll, we'll, say, we'll, we'll keep it with all new. It's the all new, the Rise to the Top podcast, episode number 11 here. And you know what? I'm rolling solo today. Rolling solo, doing something a little bit different. And I'm very excited about this episode. I hope all is well with you and yours. And I hope you've enjoyed the guests on the show. We've had a plethora, a slew, whatever you want to call it, a small army of awesome guests. And by the way, if you haven't already, you want to go back and check them out. You can find all the episodes at therisetotop.com slash iTunes and therisetotop.com slash subscribe. And anytime you want to type in an episode, you want to search for something, just type it into the Rise to the Top. So you can go to the risetop.com slash episode eight, episode seven, you want to go episode six, episode 10, whatever you want to do, we've got you covered, okay? Got you covered, my friend. So today we're going to be talking about 12 lessons from nearly 10 years in business. And this is actually based on a post that I made on Facebook a little while back. And then we put on the blog and different things like that. And, and it got just a huge response when I sent out an email about it. So I wanted to kind of turn it into podcast form and add some clarifications and some other good things as well in here. So, you know, really what I'm talking about here today is, is kind of twofold. And it's funny because 8818, which is around the quarter, so 8818 will be my official 10 years in business anniversary. I'm very excited about that. You know, to reach 10 years in anything, right, is usually pretty cool. So 8818 is coming up. And, and with the thoughts on that and, you know, all the things that have gone really well, all the challenges, all the things that have gone wrong and, and growing the business now in 2017, we we're on the Inc. 5000 list at number 938 for fastest growing companies in America. But more than that is watching my students and my customers, right? And what they've done with their businesses. Because that that's really, you know, quite honestly, what fires me up. I mean, it's, you know, I, I almost get embarrassed covering my own business. I, I love talking about my customers and students' success stories. And, you know, watching people that have grown into really strong six figure businesses seven-figure businesses in the cases of Renee Christine, Nick Stevenson, Mark Dawson, and others as well. And, you know, I keep looking at the patterns of what makes people successful, right? What what makes people that are successful and what kinds of people aren't, you know, or more more not that they aren't successful, but meaning who gets stuck, who gets stuck in the mud or isn't growing versus who are these people that explode to these six-figure, seven-figure businesses and beyond, right? And really what I did was I identified 12 different things that I think that are very important that separate the people that are successful from the people that are not or not successful yet. And I think that's another key thing here too is just, you know, if you're not successful right now, it doesn't mean you won't be successful, but it might mean that you have to change some habits or change some ways of thinking or whatever it might be, right? So let's talk about this, a few observations here. The first one is that success comes in every shape and situation, right? And, and, and what, here's what I mean by that. I've seen people create successful businesses in every possible crazy situation, you know? And I'm talking about every type of background too. I mean, age, sex, gender, location, race, every, every type of background that you could possibly imagine. I mean, I've seen it, you know, from a nearly homeless single mom of three to an academic neuroscience, okay? And what I've noticed is what separates the successful from the not is that people don't feel sorry for their situation. They don't say, oh, my situation isn't good. Instead, they make it work. Is it easy? No, of course it's not easy. It's not easy having a successful business, but they make it happen, right? And the people that aren't successful continue to 
kind of harp on those excuses saying, oh, you know, I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm too skinny, I'm too fat, you know, <laughs> I, I don't have enough time. That's a classic one as well. But the successful people, they make it happen. And it's funny because most successful, I mean, not all of them, but most successful people, they're very busy. They're very busy, meaning I see people, you know, with little kids or are working an extra job or just have time at night, whatever it might be. It's very funny how that works out. So the first thing is not making excuses for whatever your situation is, whatever your situation is, because I have seen people make it happen no matter what, right? Which leads kind of to number two, which is excuse makers and cynics need not apply, right? And this, and this is just, it's so true. I mean, meaning people that instead of saying, you know, this won't work, this won't work for me. I could tell you without a doubt, my most successful customers instead say, how can I make this work for me in my situation? And, and that is a very different kind of mindset shift or whatever you want to say. Instead of coming up with the excuses, you know, I'm not good at technology. I'm never going to understand this. I don't have the time, blah, 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 blah. Instead, these other people, the people that are successful, they say, you know what? I am going to make this happen. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. This shiznit is going to go down. It's going to happen. I don't care what I have to do. I'm going to make it happen. So excuse spacers and cynics, and this isn't going to work, and this isn't going to work for me, and the whole world's out to get me, need not apply to be successful, my friend. Okay? Now, so drink, a, drink a little bit of my, my iced coffee here today on the show. And this is a big one here. Number three is not being afraid of actual work. I know. I know. Let's talk about this. So having a successful business is hard. And don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise with this, right? If you have someone that comes up to you and says, business is so easy and, and oh, I, I just hit a button and all this magic happens, run. Run your ASS away from that person, never to return again, okay? Because there's work. There's lots of work. And we're not just talking about work for work's sake, right? Because a lot of people, as you, as you look on Instagram or even Facebook, people love talking about the grind, the hustle, the whatever that may be, right? But what I'm talking about is actually doing work on your business. Not talking about doing work, but actually doing work with an emphasis, especially on sales and marketing. Now, of course, there's other things to focus on too, but especially on sales and marketing because that, at the end of the day, your products your sales, and your marketing are the lifeblood of your business, okay? And what I see is my most successful customers, they don't do a few things. They don't do a few things. One is they don't have tons of meetings. Because I can tell you right now, meetings a lot of times end up just being time wasters and things that just don't move the needle for you. I was joking about this the other day. I was being interviewed on a podcast. I was joking, but I was dead serious. One of those things. I think I had three total meetings or something like that in 2017. I'm not a meetings person at all because, again, you could get stuck in those all day, all the time if you want to take meetings. I'm talking about taking a coffee with anyone that asks you, all that kind of stuff. You've got to have time to actually work on your business. We only have 24 hours in a day. We've got other things going on. You actually have to have time. Now, what are two other moves that people do that make them not successful? One is they, they'll join like 30 mastermind groups. I've seen this before. People join a million mastermind groups. Next thing you know, all they're doing is masterminding. They're, they're just talking about stuff. They're not actually getting in their business and executing, which is the hard part. It's easy to join a mastermind group. It's easy to take meetings. The hard thing is actually bunkering down consistently and doing the work, my friend. Right? Doing the work. Uncle DSG wants you to do the work. Okay? The other one, too, are my serial conference attenders. Okay? Now, if you're just getting started in business... Right, that these are things that you know are good, and I'm not saying you don't go to one or two a year, whatever it might be. But there's people that are at every freaking conference under the sun all the time, and I look at these people and I think, when do they have time to actually work on their business? Because they're traveling to conferences, they're they've got the big binder, they're sitting in the room, they're you know they're eating the continental breakfast, right? <laughs> whatever it might be. But when do you actually have time? To, to do the work, to actually work on your sales and marketing, to actually work on your products and programs, to actually do the things, connect with your customers, whatever it might be, that's the key. 
right there. So I can tell you without a doubt that my most successful students, not afraid of the actual work. Okay. Does that make sense? So no, to recap here, one, success comes in every shape and situation. Two, excuse makers and cynics need not apply. Three, not afraid of the actual work. Okay. Now, number four is action takers. Okay. So, you know, by the way, some decisions you make can be reckless, some can be wrong, and that's how you learn. But I can tell you without a doubt that my most successful customers and students take action. Often in a split second, they learn to trust their gut. And by the way, is every decision a correct one? Of course not. No. But it's much better to learn that way than agonize over every decision for days, months, or even years, right? Because money loves speed. I've always said that before. Money and business, they love speed. It's one of my favorite sayings. It's so true, right? And on the other hand, I know people that are debating what microphone they're going to buy for the past three years, okay? You do not want to be stuck in this. I remember hearing a situation from, and and this is kind of a sad story, but it it illustrates this point perfectly, is that one of my friends, his grandfather, always wanted to buy, it was like a Buick back in the, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't a Buick, it was a Cadillac, right? Cadillac back in the day. And he used to always, and and he had the money to buy the Cadillac, okay? But he'd go and he'd drive it. And he would, he would test it and he would look at it and he would stare at pictures and he just couldn't pull the trigger. He wanted to do it, but he just didn't want to take action. He, was, he had all these preconceived notions. He just didn't make a decision on it. And unfortunately, he passed away before he could get that Cadillac, right? Now, we're not talking about necessarily Cadillac here, but we're talking about the ability to take action and make fast decisions and knowing that you might make the wrong one. And that's okay. Right? I can tell you tons of decisions I've made that are the wrong ones. I can also tell you about tons of decisions I've made are the right ones. But I can tell you sitting on little things like this, like people debating what website should I, you know, what website software, what landing page software, what microphone or, or these kind of things, they're just time wasters, right? Because the action takers are the ones that end up moving forward. So again, I'd rather have you take action on something and fail miserably then be sitting on some random decision like that forever, okay? So don't end up like my friend's grandfather with the Cadillac. If you want to go get it, go get it, my friend, if you can, all right? Make sense? I feel like you're nodding. You're like, yes. You're like, DSG, it's a very different episode today. This is motivational. It's a little bit different. I mean, by the way, let me know. Let me know what you guys think of this. You know, if you, if you see this on email or on social media, send me an email. I always want to hear. I love hearing from listeners of the show. So always feel free to send me an email. I'll give you my direct email, in fact. It's david at the rise to the top dot com. Okay. David at the rise to the top dot com. Send me an email. Tell me what you're thinking about the podcast. If you if you're liking it, you know, always want to hear from you guys. I love it. You keep me going for sure. Okay. All right. Number five is stick to itness. Okay. Entrepreneurial ADD, very real, my friend. The shiny red ball syndrome, and it is deadly, deadly. And when my most successful students and and customers find something that works, they stick to it, and they double and triple down. And what happens is long-term success. Meanwhile, the ADD people are chasing the latest opportunity of the moment and drastically shifting their business all the time. And that doesn't mean change and new things are bad, but it does mean that once you find something that's working well, stick with it, okay? This is so important. I mean, for example... If you look at someone like Nick Stevenson, who's been on the show, he's been all over the place, we've done some things together, you've probably seen him, is that once he discovered that he loved teaching authors about marketing and writing books, right? That's what he focuses on. That's it. That, that's his business. My business is all about online courses, digital products, and programs. That's my thing, right? That's what I stick with. And here's the thing. Once you find something that works for you, and by the way, that might take a little while. That may take a few years, right? But once you find something that you love and that's working, stick with it, okay? There's people that have trouble with this, and I've seen this where every year they're doing something different or every six months. You know, this this year they're talking about fitness. Next year they're talking about, you know, how to make your own soap. The year after that, they're talking about how to inspire others. And the year after that, they're talking about how to grow your own, you know, home zoo. 
I don't know, whatever it might be. That's what you don't want to end up doing. You don't want to be in that entrepreneurial ADD method of flying around like a crazy person. Once something's working, you love it, stick with it, my friends. That's where long-term success comes from. And I can tell you, as I approach this 10 years in business, that's what this is all about, is long-term success. This is kind of a ranting side note, is that I've seen so many people miss out on that long-term success because all they cared about was the extreme short-term. And that means not caring about customers. That means you know just caring about how big their latest launch is, and then they disappear into the, into the wilderness. I've seen this happen. I've seen... I can name people. I'm not going to do that. It's not very nice, right? I can name people that were building kind of nice businesses, but then something happened. The stick to itness disappeared with these people. They, they either burnt out or you know maybe they had some awesome launch, but they didn't think about long-term sales of their course or their program. And all of a sudden, broop, broop, problems, right? So again, stick to itness, very, very important. Okay. Now, number six is try and fail, right? Many people try things. Everyone fails at some point. That's just a fun fact. The question is, what do you do after your first 50th or 500th failure or 5,000th failure? Do you give up? Do you learn from it? Right? My most successful customers aren't afraid to keep learning and trying. In fact, this is one of the things that I talked about in some of the earlier episodes of this podcast. I talked about in 2017 what worked, what was an epic failure, and why. I believe that's episode three, the risestop.com slash episode three. I, I reviewed 2017 in extreme detail. I told you everything that we did in business and what worked and what didn't, okay? Here's the key is that you wanna try, learn, diagnose what went right, what went wrong, and try again, okay? You gotta be willing to fail and you gotta be willing to keep going. And, and I can tell you that resiliency is so important in this because it's not gonna be the first mistake. It's gonna be the it's gonna be the the 30th, right? Do you sit there and say, oh my God, I did a webinar and I forgot to plug in my microphone. I'm just gonna give up on this. Or, oh my God, I can't figure out how to do my website. Or, or oh my God, you know, I just launched something new and I screwed up all the emails. Whatever it is, do you give up or do you learn from it and keep going? And that is a huge separator in what makes people successful and what keeps other people stuck in the mud. Right, so you got to be thinking about this. And again, all these things in here that I'm talking about here today, and we got six more of these, right? Is six or five? I'm not really good at counting. It's one or the other. But keep this in mind: that all these things, if this is you, if you're thinking, "Oh my God, I do give up a lot," or "Oh my God, I don't have a ton of stick to itness," or "Oh my God, I'm not really an action taker," or "Oh my God, I make all kinds of excuses," that's okay. Just be aware of it and think, okay, well now. I know that this is actually a problem. I'm going to shift it in the future. I'm going to do, I used to take six months to make every little random decision. I'm going to now make it where I'm going to put an hourglass thing on my, on my desk, flip it over. And when that's done, the decision's going to be made, right? Just little shifts like that can take you from, again, that non-successful point to being more successful. I, I can tell you that right now, it just takes a shift, just takes a shift. So I'm helping, even if one person listens to this episode today, one person, and they make some kind of change that results in them being more successful with their business, I'm a happy man. I'll tell you that right now. If you make just, I'm telling you, just one little thing, right, can make such a difference. It may not be all 12 days. It might just be one thing you're going to change. Awesome. Go for it, right? Now, number seven is thick skin, okay? And I actually faced this this morning when my dad called me. We had some kind of out of control person threatening random things at us. It happens all the time. It happens to everybody. Okay. There are a lot of meanie, meanie, meanie jerkosauruses out there. And they come in all shapes and forms. And at some point, they will find you. <laughs> they will find you. The internet is a big yet small place. Okay. But what happens then? What happens when you start getting some hate, right? Some people that are hurting your feelings. And by the way, I've heard it all, my friends gotten lots of love, gotten lots of hate. I've heard everything, okay? What happens though when you start getting some hate, right? And I've seen this and it is affecting many people. I can think of some examples of people that get it way worse. I mean, people that get it just 
they get scrutinized all the time. But here's the question. What happens? Well, first of all, it's human to be upset, right? I mean, I'm not going to tell you that when you don't get hate or something like that, it's not going to affect you emotionally or whatever it might be. It, it is. That's normal, right? That, that is absolutely normal. I mean, you should care, right? But I can tell you for a fact that my most successful customers and students don't change what they're doing or how they're doing it because of meanies, okay? Keep that in mind. So if a mean person comes in and says, you know what? I hate your freaking shirt. Don't you ever, ever wear that white shirt again, you stupid idiot, right? And that was like the nicest meanie I've ever heard, okay? What happens? Do you say, oh my God, I'm never gonna wear this shirt again? Or do you say, you know what? I'm gonna defiantly wear that shirt all the time, okay? And I've seen this, that people... Some people fold like a cheap deck chair at the first sign of criticism or get into fights with people on the internet. Ain't nobody got time for that, right? Bye, Felicia. Block people, get rid of people. You don't have time to be fighting with people on the internet. Are you kidding me? I see this happen all the time. I see people that actually go out there and some of my competitors even do this. It just makes me smile. They will literally just get into fights with people on Facebook ads, on Facebook, on Instagram. I mean, come on. How much, how much energy do we need to do? You just got to brush off the haters give them a little sip of haterade and let them move on. But my point of this is not that your feelings about feelings. My point is about decisions in your business. You need to not make decisions or change anything you're doing based on a hater, okay? I've had people tell me everything. I hate the way you write. I hate the way you talk. I hate the way you send the emails. I hate this or that. I don't care, <laughs> right? I could care less. I laugh, I wave, smile and wave. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Bye-bye now, right? And the thing is, you just don't want to do that because I've had people where the opposite has happened and it's been detrimental to them. So for example, I'm just throwing out an example. Let's just say you're charging $1,000 for your online course, okay? And I've seen someone where they get like one hate mail from someone that says, $1,000, you're a ripoff. You're a blah, 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 right? $1,000, whatever it might be. You should only charge... $50, $50, not $1,000, blah, and I hate your shirt, right? <laughs> That's my hater. That's my hater voice. They, they freak out. They say, oh my God, maybe I am charging too much. Maybe I should charge $50. I'm going to go change everything because this one jerkosaurus said this one mean thing or two jerkosauruses or five jerkosauruses, right? The bottom line here is you have to stick with what you're doing and have thick skin. Whew, that was an important one. That got me fired up. That got me, I, I, I really think my heart rate rose up on that one, my friends. My heart rate is like cha-chang, you know, here on this podcast, all right? All right, number eight is realizing they don't know everything, okay? There's an old saying that you never want to be the smartest person in the room, and while we're all so wonderful, we're all very smart, we're all so good looking, we're all so very sexy, right? But put the ego aside when it comes to business And my most successful customers and students seek help and are willing to listen, learn, and implement, right? The day we start being that, hey, we know everything and we know the best way, I mean, you may as well stick a fork in it because it's freaking done. So you have to realize that you don't know everything, right? And and I I go through this all the time too. I I realize, oh, well, I have no idea on this. I need to find someone that does. And the key here is you have to be willing, you have to be, there's a term with this which is coachable, right? Coachable. So when I don't know something, what do I do? Well, a variety of different things. You know, I might buy a product or program on it. That's normally my number one move. So if I don't know something and I want to learn how to do it, I'm going to go see what's the world's best course on that subject. I'm going to buy it and I'm going to implement it, right? That's one way to go about it. Another one, if you, if you crave more one-on-one attention or whatever it might be, is hiring a coach or a consultant to help you with that, right? So hey, I need someone to come in. I need a professional to help me with that. That's another option as well. But the thing is, you know, realizing that, again, you might not have the answers and there's people that have gone before you that can help mentor you in one way or another, right? Whether it's an online course or one-on-one help or whatever it might be, you just have to realize that's one of the keys to moving forward in business. Make sense? Makes sense. I feel like we're all nodding here, right? Okay. Number nine is team builders. And by the way, I'll put a recap of these and my podcast editors who are so brilliant and smart will do this as well. I will make sure that we take these 12 points and put them also 
in a text form under the show notes here at the risetop.com slash episode 11. So if you want to go back and read this, check it out. Again, it'll be at the risetop.com slash episode number 11. Don't type number in. It's episode 11. Okay. All right. Number nine is team builders. Okay. So you can't do everything yourself. You know, even if you're good at something, it might make more sense for someone else to do it so you can focus on other important things. I'll get back to that point in a second. That's very important. Okay. You might start out solo. A lot of people in online business and courses and having a personality based business, they start out solo. A lot of us do. I started out solo. I was solo for several years, right? But over time, you'll be so burned out and stressed that something not so good will happen, okay? Not only do my most successful customers and students seek help to grow their business, right? So employees, contractors, experts, whatever it might be, they also realize their most valuable asset is time and creating a team creates leverage and growth, okay? And whether that's just going from you to also hiring a virtual assistant, that was my first move that I did way back in the day was hiring a virtual assistant. And then we now have a team of four employees plus contractors and other things as well. But you have to realize that over time, you can't do everything yourself. You know, from administration tasks to customer service, especially because that's a great way to burn yourself out as the face of the brand, right, is doing your own customer service. You will want to shoot yourself. You do not want to shoot yourself. That's not good. Is realize that you want to build over time. Now, you might not have the money or wherewithal to do it now, but you have to have that long-term thinking with that. And a lot of people think, well, you just outsource the tasks or outsource or insource the tasks that you don't want to do or that you're not good at. And that's true, but also think about things that you're doing that you would be more effective if someone else did it for you. Example, I'll throw out a random example, editing. Let's just, I don't like editing, but let's just say you love editing. You love it. You, you're, you enjoy the act of editing your videos or podcasts or whatever it might be, right? Well, it might make sense for someone else to do that for a you know, nominal fee while you focus on other things that are more important in growing the business. So sure, you might like it, but it's actually very time consuming and there's other work that you should be doing instead. Maybe it's better that you're connecting with partners or that you're you know, working on your latest product launch emails, whatever it might be, right? That's the thing that you have to think about is that a lot of times the cliche advice on this is outsource the things you don't want to do and that you don't know anything about. But there's also the other side of it of saying, hey, I do know this. I do like it. But guess what? That's not really where my best use of time is in my business. So think about that. That's even something you could write down is write down on a sheet of paper, like what are all the tasks that you're doing, right? Like write down everything you do for a week. Like just have a sheet of paper next to you. Every time you do something, write it down. Like, you know, wrote a marketing email, boop, edited a course video, boop you know, wrote a blog post and posted it and sent it out. Boop, write down everything and then start circling things that could be done by someone else, could be done by someone else. So for example, a marketing email, probably not gonna be done by someone else, right? Because you're gonna write that. You're the face of the brand. You're You're probably the copywriter, right? You're sending that out. That's gonna be you. But maybe someone else could edit that email for you. Make sure your spelling's all good and maybe send it even out through your email CRM, whatever you're using, right? That's something that could be easily outsourced. So if you start thinking about that, and one of my mindset shifts that was very important for me personally was when something comes across my plate now, it used to be, how fast can I get this done or how can I do this right now? Instead, my first thought is, is this better suited for a team member of mine and not me? That's my first thought on every single thing that comes across my desk, right? Everything. So is this better for me or is this better for one of my teammates? And you learn this stuff over time when it comes to building a team. But I can tell you for sure, if you want to scale up six figures, seven figures beyond that, you have to be thinking of building a team. And I got to tell you, this scares people. They think, oh, of employees and scary and management. No, I can tell you, I'll do another episode on this in the future. We'll talk about hiring and, and employees and contractors and stuff like that. But I gotta, you got to shift your mindset away from this and realize that's how you're going to grow. It's one of the key things for growing. Okay? Cool? Cool. All right. Number 10 is positive. Positive. So sure, not every positive person out there is successful, right? I mean, I know there's 
plenty of people out there that are more the dreamers in the clouds and you know they don't really follow number 11 that I'm going to talk about in a second. We're on number 10 right now. But I could tell you, I could tell you that I have found very few, if any, negative people that are successful. Very few, if any. And just to go quickly on to the next one, because this is, there's no, I mean, that was self-explanatory, being positive, right? However, positivity means nothing without number 11. And number 11 is execution, okay? Execution. And this is where it's all about. This is the coup de grace. This is the holy grail. This is the whatever we want to call it right here. Is that, sure, successful entrepreneurs have great ideas. I mean, duh, right? Every successful entrepreneur has great ideas. But what they really do is execute. They execute under all circumstances, not when everything's perfect. Not when everything's perfect. So my fitness trainer, Ryan, always says, if people just showed up at the gym when everything was perfect, it would be about twice a year. Meaning your body's feeling perfect, you got enough sleep, you had the perfect food, you're like ready to go, you're like Rambo going into the gym. How often would that be in a yearly basis? The people that are successful, the ones that show up to the gym when they're you know, a little tired, very busy, they're, they're not feeling 100%. I'm not talking about being sick, that's stupid, but I'm saying you know, they show up, right? It's not just when everything's perfect, it's being able to put in the work right? To execute what you need to do regardless of what else is going on in the situation, right? A little tired, a little busy, a little stressed. You're able to do what you need to do, okay? And execution is the key. And if you, if you keep thinking about this, you could be the best executor and that will lead to a successful business. I mean, you could take a relatively crappy idea, not a terrible one, <laughs> Not a terrible idea, but you could take a crappy-ish idea and execute it extremely well and have a good business. I know that sounds crazy, but it's true, okay? Because at the end of the day, it's all about that execution. That's all about that execution, okay? Which also leads to number 12. The final one here today is long-term patience, but still moving quickly. So I know that seems like a oxymoron. You know, move swift, but be patient, but you got to think long-term. It's not about overnight success. It's about putting in the work and moving forward. And my most successful customers and students, they have the patience to outlast everyone else while still executing day-to-day. So you're micro-executing day-to-day, whether those are your marketing emails, you're putting your products together, you know, connecting with like-minded people, whatever it might be, that's your day-to-day, but you have to have the long-term patience for growing this business over time. And I can tell you this without a doubt, over 10 years, People come to me, how long, you know, how have you sustained in this business? I see so many people that burn out after a year or two, if that, or three or four years, but you're coming up on 10. What do you do? I say, I just keep going. I'm like that little, I'm like a blind energizer bunny. Just keep on going. I just go forward. And over time, things get better. I mean, you just, it's, I don't want to say it's a race against time. It's a race with time is that you have to be patient, right? The people that are not patient, they lose because Let's say they launch an online course, they launch a new program, and let's say they do a few thousand dollars in sales or something like that, and they get frustrated and they say, oh my God, I see people making six figures and seven figures, but I just made a couple thousand or even a couple hundred dollars. I'm a failure. I'm out of here. That's it. No, that's not how this works. You have to be thinking long-term. That was just your first launch. Now what can you do, right? Let's build a bigger audience. Let's do another launch. Let's do some evergreen things. There's so many different things that you can do right? You have to be thinking long term in this business, okay? And again, this is where people get hung up and they just think, oh my God, if I don't become a millionaire overnight, it's just not worth it. It's not happening. This is a grind and it's a fun grind and it's a good grind, but you have to have that mentality. You have to have that mentality, okay? So that, my friends, is my mini laundry list of success. And this, is, this was not based on theory. This was not just even based on myself, right? But this was literally taking a look at thousands of students now over the past 10 years that have learned from my trainings and what I've seen in these programs. And I've seen people literally go from scratch to six figures and seven figures and beyond and sustaining that for years and years and years. This is not based on rah-rah chance or woo-woo or whatever the heck we call them nowadays. Woo, right? This isn't about some saying printed on a t-shirt that we're just going to post on the Instagram, right? This is straight up from my experience, and again, what I've seen from my thousands of customers. So again, I hope you like this, guys. This was a very different type of episode here on number 11 on the Rise to the Top. 
let me know. Again, fire me a comment, whatever it might be, Dave at the com. Let me know how you like it. Again, enjoy the show. I'll be back with you next week. Brand new episode. If you haven't subscribed, the rise to the slash subscribe. We've got all kinds of places that you can subscribe to the show. We're, we're coming out on some new places too. I know we're on Stitcher. I think we're going to also be on iHeartRadio and a few other places as well. So make sure to check that out, therisetop.com slash subscribe. You can also subscribe via email. iTunes, of course. You could go directly to iTunes at therisetop.com slash iTunes. We are also have Facebook Messenger updates, which I think are really cool. You get a little Messenger update when we post new episodes. So all that kind of good stuff you could check out at therisetop.com slash subscribe. And again, the show notes and other goodies at therisetop.com slash episode 11. All right, my friends. This is DSG rolling solo today, signing off. This has been the Rise to the Top podcast. I'm David Seidman Garland. And remember, if you want some fluff, you know what to do. Go pet a bunny. Go pet a bunny.